because I told our uh, executive producer, Jay, that I would like some hazard pay for having to talk about the Jets for a solid yep. five to ten minutes. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monkey Knife Fight Live NFL show week five. I'm your host, Dan Watkins. Joining me as always on our Friday show is Nick Whalen of rotowire.com. Nick, week five, here we are. And any week that starts off with a 99 yard Geno Smith touchdown drive and a uh, double punt, I think is a good oh, yeah. week in my book. So, how are you feeling, man? We got a great Thursday night game again last night. I, I think of all the ones we've had so far, this may have been like the most poorly played game, despite having two really talented teams. Uh, the, the Rams, Matthew Stafford kind of looked like a mess at times in that first half. Uh, Seattle obviously had trouble moving the ball, especially early on. But like you said, we get Geno Smith to the rescue for, for a couple minutes there. It looked like we were going to have a hell of a story where Geno Smith comes in. Russell Wilson's finger is like dangling. Uh, it looked like he, he kind of wanted to come back in, but they were riding the hot hand with Geno. And, you know, I'm, I'm texting with some buddies and talking to friends. We're like, Geno Smith's about to do this. Immediately throws a backbreaking interception. Game's over. Rams hold on. Um, but for a moment there, it felt like we were going to have a mini Geno Smith renaissance. Yeah, and, and I'm already loving the memes. Uh, and it's just a lot of them are just uh, Big Ben with his just head down, like just just looking at the ground. It's just like when you realize Geno Smith is now better than you, too. So uh, uh, I mean, uh, he looked that those first two drives, it was like he was looking suspiciously good. Like that, that even that touchdown pass to the corner to Metcalf was like, wow, OK, I, I didn't know Geno Smith had this in him. I, th- I think it w- there was just a little bit of shock and awe factor on the Ramps sideline going on. Yeah, there. Well, they, they didn't game plan for Geno. So, no, not at all. <laughs> there was no game plan for Geno Smith last night, but we have a nice game plan for week five this week. Uh, before we get to the games, uh, I do want to let you guys know, for any of you that are watching this early on Friday, we record this on Fridays. It'll be up at 2 o'clock. Um, and if you decide to play, uh, a contest from 4 to 6 p.m. on Friday, October 8th. We're boosting payouts on select NFL contests this weekend. Just look for a little lightning bolt symbol and uh, for, for your entry, and there will be different kind of boosters and all that kind of stuff. So just check those out from 4 to 6 on Friday, and uh, good luck this weekend. With that being said, uh, Nick, I think I'm going to need you to do a little wellness check on me by the end of the show because we're starting off talking NFL London Jets and Falcons. I told our uh, – executive producer Jay that I would like some hazard pay for having to talk about the jets for a solid yep. five to 10 minutes. So you can hop on that bandwagon with me. If you could want. be two to three minutes. doesn't have to be five to 10 minutes. All right. Well, we'll see. We'll see how long we go here. Uh, but NFL London, I'm sure Nick, you are our resident Jacksonville Jaguars fan. You got to have some very nice thoughts about the NFL London experience since the Jags have played there more than anybody else in the NFL. Uh, but let's start off talking about Zach Wilson. 245.5 is his more or less uh, last week. Hey, the Jets, they shocked the world, beating the Tennessee Titans. Zach finishing with 297 yards. The Falcons giving up about 264 passing yards a game. Can, is this something that Zach Wilson can build on? Jamison Crowder finally making his debut last week. He had a nice little connection there with him. So how do you feel about Zach Wilson in London against the Falcons? I, I think Zach Wilson's probably due for a little bit of regression this week. Um, I mean, he was very impressive through most of week four. I, I think that was – I was saying that was easily his best game. I think he had probably like his three best throws of the entire season all in that game. The one to Corey Davis uh, being the standout play. You have to keep in mind that, you know, that play is somewhat fluky. I mean, that tacked on what an extra 55 yards to his yardage total. Um, and then they played an entire overtime period, you know, so, you know, plus 15 minutes, a couple more drives. Um, I, I do think we see some regression yardage wise. Not that this is a great Falcons defense by any means, obviously playing this game in London, weird time, you know, you got, some players not even making the trip. Calvin Ridley looking at you. Um, I'm not really sure how this game plays out. I wouldn't be shocked if the Jets, you know, get some momentum from that win over Tennessee and are able to put up a pretty good fight here against Atlanta. But I, I don't see, I don't think we see a day where Zach Wilson is just all of a sudden the guy that we saw in the second half of last week and he's slinging the ball around. Um, I, I think he's still going to struggle for the most part this season. I, I, Long term, I, I still like him quite a bit. I, I think you, you, you'll live with a lot of kind of head scratching mistakes when you see the type of plays that this guy can make when he's on. Um, I mean, he, he has one of the best arms in the league, you know, in terms of rolling out, being able to sling it on a line 60 yards in the air. Not many guys can do that. So you'll live with the mistakes if you have a guy uh, who could reach those heights. But I, I still think week to week, you know, it's going to be a struggle. Um, he, he's not going to be just a, a 250 plus guy uh, from here on out. So 
again, it, acknowledging that this is not a fantastic Atlanta Falcons defense, I do think they can contain Zach Wilson this week in London. So you're going less than 245? I'm going less. All right. And one thing, though, if you do want to go with the more, don't worry necessarily about the Jets getting out to a slow start. They have the worst first half offense in all of football. They're averaging just 2.5 points a game in the first half so far. And uh, their yardage totals, the outputs have just been terrible. They had just 86 total yards last week against the Titans in the first half. So the Jets do kind of take a little bit to get going. Uh, On the other side, you got Matt Ryan, 280.5 is his number. And for Matt Ryan against the Jets, that seems like a gimme, I feel like. But as you mentioned, Calvin Ridley not making the trip to London due to personal matters. Uh, The Jets defense giving up about 226 passing yards a game, but they haven't really played uh, any quarterback yet that I think is at Matt Ryan's level. So it's an interesting spot here for Matt Ryan in this, uh, this London game. And I got to think also that this could finally be the day that we uh, see Kyle Pitts break out as well. Yeah. There's been a lot of Kyle Pitts talk on Twitter the last couple of days. Um, you know, there's kind of two ways to look at it. It's well, there, there's no Ridley. So now they have to throw to Pitts, or it's there's no Ridley and the defense could focus even more on shutting down Kyle Pitts who has been fairly disappointing. I think so far. Um, you know, he's, I think he's looked fine. He still looks like a freak when he has the ball in his hands. He just hasn't had it in his hands all that much. Um, they, they might not have much of a choice to force feed him in this game, but, but keep in mind, they do have Jerry Rice 2.0 in Cordero Patterson. Uh, so they're, they're not completely devoid of weapons, uh, in this offense, I, 280 and a half. I mean, in a game that could weirdly be like a sloppy shootout. I, 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 I don't hate going more here. Um, we, we've seen Matt Ryan go, go more than this number and less than this number twice already. Uh, but factoring in the absence of Ridley, factoring in, you know, the potential for just a weird travel week, jet lag, you know, team looking a little sloppy. Uh, like you mentioned, I've, I've watched plenty of 8.30 a.m. Jaguars games where both teams just look like they're still half asleep. I think there's a possibility for that in this game. So I'm going to go less on Ryan as well. well. We'll double up and go less on both quarterbacks. All right. Less in London. I like it. Let's talk about Kyle Pitts, though, for a minute. 52.5 is his number. Uh, he's gone over that just once. He had 73 yards in week two. He finished with 50 yards last week, uh, just four receptions on nine targets against the Washington defense. I like, I feel like, I feel like this is the week we see Kyle Pitts. I mean, this was the guy that, uh, the analysts before the draft were draft were like, I, I remember watching one show and I, I don't remember exactly who it was, but the, the question was, if you had to pick one hall of famer from this upcoming draft class, who's your pick? And they're all going, Kyle Pitts, Kyle Pitts, Kyle Pitts. And so mm-hmm. far, he has not looked great. But I think against the Jets, this could be the perfect time for him. How do you feel about that 52 and a half for Pitts? Yeah, I like it. I think this is an opportunity for him to hit that more. Um, you know, again, there is an argument that this defense can kind of focus exclusively on trying to shut him down. Um, but I, I also think you know he's, he's big enough, strong enough, fast enough that he can find ways to get open. And, and if he's going to get you know, nine, ten targets, he had nine. That, that was a career high last week. If, he can, if you can guarantee me he gets to nine targets, I, I would almost guarantee you that he goes over 52 and a half. And, and again, w- without Calvin Ridley, I, I think there's a very good chance we see Kyle Pitts maybe have his first double digit target game of the season. That would be huge. Uh, I, I, like you said, you know, he hasn't been super efficient, even when he has been, you know, getting six, seven, eight targets. Uh, but I think that comes around eventually. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty difficult, I, I think, for a guy with that kind of hype coming in to a team that has a new head coach, has a quarterback who's kind of gradually fading year by year, um, a, a team that seemingly since making the Super Bowl has just dropped off a level every single year. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's as magical as just like, this guy's a great athlete, so he's going to be great right away. Um, yeah, I, I think he was actually put in a relatively difficult spot in Atlanta, a team that I, I feel like is counting on a rookie tight end to magically fix an offense that's been broken for a while. And then is there anyone else in this uh, this matchup that you like in this one? I, I know we got Jameson Crowder up on the screen there. 54.5 yeah. is his number. He finished with 61 last week in his debut, and he's already seems to be uh, Zach Wilson's favorite target for the Jets. Yeah, nine targets for Crowder last week. Was able to haul in seven of those. Um, you know, could have had a couple more. He, he was uh, the victim of a couple of missed throws by, by Zach Wilson in that game. This one's tough. I mean, we, we have a one game sample of Crowder and it, it happened to be Wilson's best game. You know, maybe that's a factor in, in Wilson having a little bit more comfort uh, with an experienced receiver like Crowder. I, I think I'm going to go less though. You know, I, I like the less on, I think it was what, 245 for Wilson. That's a fairly low number. Um, I, you know, I, I think the Jets will, will be able to move the ball a little bit better than they did weeks one through three. But again, I'm expecting a kind of a grinded out, um, you know, some regression from that Jets offense. So After a nice week four, I I think Browder kind of knocks it down a little bit and and I'll go less here. 
All right, let's uh, let's move on here to the 1 p.m. the early slate. No real marquee game in this one, so we're just going to kind of throw some guys that we've had our eyes on here out at you guys. And uh, the first one, we are going to talk about our featured two by two, and that's Tom Brady and Kirk Cousins. Tom Brady's taking on the Miami Dolphins. His number is three ten point five for Brady. After finishing just with two sixty nine last week against New England. I like the less here big time in this one. I think this is this game has all the makings of a bit of a letdown for Tampa. I think last week just took a lot out of them mentally, especially Brady. Uh, and you can see it. I mean, Tom is, I mean, he's becoming the king of social media in the NFL as well in his videos. He just like, he just looks tired after what last week took out of him. Um, and, and also still no Gronk. And that made a big difference for this Tampa offense last week up in New England. Yep. It definitely took a, a dimension out of their out of their passing attack. So I'm going less than 310 for Brady. And also we have a huge sample size for Tom against Miami in his career. If you if you care about that, 35 career games against the Dolphins averages yeah. just 234 yards in those contests. Mm-hmm. So how do you feel about TB12? Man, I, I was all set to confidently go more here, but that, that those are pretty compelling numbers uh, on the other side. But I, I, you know, I, I think there is a case that this could be another letdown for Tampa Bay. But to me, I feel like last week was the letdown. And maybe this is the big bounce back, you know, where I, I think a lot of people thought they would come into New England, stop that team and and walk out of there bouncing back, you know, off that loss to the Rams two weeks ago. And, you know, they were they were a, you know, what, six inches of, of field goal width away from probably losing that game. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there's still time on the clock for Brady to march down. But I, I think the rain really affected that offense. I, I think they you know, we saw a couple of kind of borderline drops from Antonio Brown on that last drive. Um, the Gronk thing is the biggest factor for me, honestly. I, I think it was extremely evident how much they depend on Rob Gronkowski, especially inside the 30-yard line. You know, this team looked kind of lost when they would get near the red zone and Brady didn't have that guy who you could just throw it up to or, or fire a dart in there and he catches it pretty much automatically. So that that is certainly a factor here. And like you said, Brian Flores, Miami always seemed to have Brady's number, whether it's in New England or Tampa. But I, I, I do still think there's so much talent on this Bucks offense. I mean, yeah, you take Gronk away, but you still have Godwin. You still have Evans. You still have Antonio Brown. Um, you know, I mean, Leonard Fournette still, in my mind, a, a fairly above average running back, um, obviously as an ex-Jag. But I, I think this goes the other way. I think Tampa bounces back a little bit after two straight weeks of this offense not looking all that great. Uh, I think they find a way to move the ball, and, and Brady has what would be his, what, third 300-yard game already? Yeah, uh, I do have the numbers right here for Brady. Hang on, somewhere. <laughs> uh, Tom Brady. This Show year. us the notes. Yeah. Hold yes. up the notes. Yes. <laughs> the notes. The notes are here. The notes Drop are the right notes. here. My Tom Brady <laughs> notes are right here. Yes, he does have uh, two games with more than 375. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been boom or bust. You know, so yeah, 310, it's like you're not, compared to his big games this year, you're not necessarily asking that much. But as you alluded to, I mean, his, when, when he's been off, like this offense has been pretty off. So yeah. we'll, we'll see how it goes. But I, I'm going to go more. Uh, we'll, we'll go head to head on this one. All right. And let's go with, let's talk about Kirk Cousins here. 275.5 is his total uh, against the Detroit Lions at home. Lions giving up about 251 passing yards a game. Cousins, seven career games against Detroit. He's averaging exactly 275 yards in those contests. But the three home home games uh, since he went to the Vikings, he's just his highest passing total in those three games is just 242. So he struggled at home against the Lions. Uh, oh, Cousins is up to 290.5. So he shot up here as we've been, uh, as we've been shooting this. Um, I, I, I don't really know which I'm going to kind of go less here. Cause I feel like that number is just a little high. And if Dalvin cooks back, I feel like they're going to want to get him involved quite a bit. How do you feel about Kirk Cousins at 290.5? Yeah, I think your point about cook stands. Um, I mean, I've, I've heard some chatter that you know, if you're the Vikings, do you feel confidently above uh, enough about this game that you maybe consider sitting Dalvin cook again, just to kind of use this as almost like a bye week and then you bring him back, you know, closer to full strength. You basically don't want him to like be at 75% and then have him play and he's knocked down to 50 again. And it's just this cycle that goes uh, throughout the entire season. So I think that that could be a possibility. You know, you mentioned Detroit. I mean, they, they, they've allowed, I think, close to the fewest passing yards in the league, but that's also kind of a hollow stat because, you know, teams have only thrown the ball 101 times against them through four games. And, and obviously they've trailed in a lot of those games. Teams have been able to gouge them with the run. So yeah, yeah, they haven't allowed a ton of yardage, but they're also second worst in the league in terms of yards per attempt allowed. So when teams do throw, they are able to get almost nine yards per attempt, which is a huge number. Jacksonville's the only team worse than that, believe it or not. Um, so I, I do think I like Kirk Cousins to go more here. Uh, it is a high number. I would have felt better about it, you know, with that original number. But 
290.5 for a guy who has two elite receivers, um, you know, some other receivers that have stepped up uh, kind of coming out of nowhere to be a third guy for them. But, you know, I, I think this is a game where, where Minnesota, you know, is able to finally get a win, finally start to feel a little bit better about themselves. I, I think it's kind of the opposite of what we saw last week where drive after drive after drive, they're just stonewalled by that Cleveland defense. And then let's, I, I, I said before uh, at the top of the, uh, the early slate, um, breakdown here that there was really no marquee game, but it turns out we do have two guys that are going head to head. Uh, you can play this contest. It's uh, the, in the Packers Bengals game, Aaron Rodgers and Joe Burrow. Let's talk about Aaron Rodgers here for a minute. His number just 265.5 against the Bengals. Uh, Rodgers, I feel like we've entered this new phase of Aaron Rodgers where it's just kind of game manager, just going to get the win and not really necessarily worried about balling out and being that MVP that we've seen yeah. in the past. His season high at passing output is 261. That was that Sunday night game against San Fran a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I, like at the beginning of the season, if you if you told me uh, you're going to have Aaron Rodgers with his total being 265 against Cincinnati, I'm all in on the more. But now, but just the way Green Bay's been playing, I'm a, really hesitant with this one. I, I'm, I'm a little scared to go more here. Yeah, same here. Same here. I mean, like you said, Rodgers, he's still among the elite quarterbacks, no question. He's the reigning MVP. He still racks up touchdowns at, at like the highest rate in the league. But yeah, the yardage really hasn't been there for a while now you know he's, he's not he's not reeling off 400 yard games like he was back in the day where you know it felt like twice a game there would be like a 60 yarder where Jordy Nelson is just running wide open but nobody around him like the Packers don't really have as many of those gash plays anymore you know they're they're more than happy to take three downs get the first down take three more downs get the first down all of a sudden you're at the 20 and 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 you know Aaron Jones is running it in like the, the offense I think is lethal and looks it's starting to look a lot like it did last year but yeah, Rodgers is not a, a, a lock to just go 300-plus every single week. And, and this Bengals defense, I think, has looked pretty good. You know, it's a little concerning coming off that game against Jacksonville last week where, where the Jags you know, should have been up 21 nothing in that first half. Of course, they had that failed, um, just horrific play call on fourth down around the goal line. Um, but Jacksonville was able to move the ball. You know, DJ Chark went out in, like, the second play of the game uh, with, with that broken ankle, and they were still able to move the ball. That's a little concerning to me, but – I also think Green Bay, you know, is, is fine moving the ball on the ground. You know, I think they will be able to go up and down on the field on Cincinnati, but I don't necessarily think it's Rodgers slinging it. So I'll, I'll join you here. I think the Packers get the win in Cincinnati, um, but I, I think they're, they're a little more reliant on, on the ground game. Rodgers can maybe get to two, three, four touchdowns, but I think it's a lot of those quick passes that we see, you know, in the red zone where he's racking those up instead of long downfield passes. Yep. And then on the other side, you got Joe Burrow, 270.5. Green Bay, surprisingly, their pass defense yardage-wise, it's looking pretty good, only giving up 209 uh, yards per game through the air. Uh, is this something to build on for Joe Burrow from last week? Obviously, it looks like he's going to be getting T. Higgins back, but he might not have Joe Mixon this weekend. So the run the backfield uh, could be a little mm -hmm. questionable there, whether it's P. Ryan or whoever else he'll be handing the ball off to. But how do you feel about Burrow in that 270 number, which he's only gone over once so far this year? Yeah. yeah, man, this, this one's really difficult. Like you said, T. Higgins should be back. Uh, our friends at rotowire.com said he did go through practice on Friday. So that looks good. And that, that's, a big, that's a big deal for them. I mean, T. Higgins is still, I think, their number one guy. I mean, Jamar Chase has, has been impressive and has racked up touchdowns. But I, I think Higgins is still kind of the safety blanket for Joe Burrow. I, we're not going to see Jair Alexander in this game. I, I think they're still listing him as questionable, which is insane because like earlier in the week, there was talk that his season might be done. And if you saw that play uh, where he injured his shoulder, like it was very clear that something happened uh, immediately. I, th I thought he broke his collarbone, like the way he squared up on that hit. So you're missing your best defensive back. Um, you know, you, you, you kind of tried and failed to get Stefan Gilmore uh, for, for cap reasons more than anything. You do have a, a, a rookie in Eric Stokes who's looked pretty good, but you know, Kevin King likely back this week. That's that's not a good thing for this uh, Packers defense. I think when everybody's fully healthy, they, they could be pretty decent. You know, they have some top-end talent. Um, obviously, they're, they're missing Zedarius Smith, but you take Smith out, you take Jair Alexander out, uh, I start to worry quite a bit uh, about the secondary. So I'm going to go just over on Joe Burrow. I don't know that he gets to 300, but I think he can top 270 and a half. And I'm glad you brought up the uh, the attempted recruitment of Stephon Gilmore for the Green Bay Packers. The guy that was leading that charge was uh, Devontae Adams, who uh, yeah. he commented on Gilmore's Instagram post, call me, 
And then he posted on Twitter later that night after Gilmore got traded to Carolina, he never called. So that did not happen <laughs> there. Uh, that is why Gilmore is in the NFC South now. But Devontae Adams is another one of our guys here we want to talk about. 94.5 is Adams' more, more or less number uh, in this game with, with Rodgers. And if we're going going less with Rodgers, 260, can, can Adams yeah. still get over that 90, uh, 95-yard total? I mean, he definitely can, but I, I think what you're implying, you know, is like if, if we're going less on Rodgers, does that mean Devontae is going to account for like 40, 45 percent of that yardage? I, I mean, it's, it's tough to say, but if anybody could do it, it would be him. Right. I mean, it, I, I don't know that there's a, you know, maybe other than Cooper Cup in L.A., I don't know if there's a, a quarterback receiver tandem, you know, where the quarterback is so reliant on one guy. Um, and if you could pick somebody for that to be, it would be Devontae Adams. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but even last week, you know, we saw Randall Cobb start to get more involved. I, I think. At some point, they're going to get Alan Lazard a little more involved here. I mean, MBS has been banged up the last couple of weeks. I think that opened the door for Randall Cobb last week. We'll see. I mean, I, I, I would be inclined to go just less on that number. I mean, Devontae, his floor at this point is so high um, that, you know, he's going to get you like minimum like 55, 60 yards. Um, but, but, you know, a lot of those are quick passes like we talked about. He's not exactly a deep threat. Um, and if he's not able to break a tackle or two, you know, right away after the catch, he's, he's usually not racking up a ton of yak yards. So. Uh, I, I think this number is just a little bit too high for me uh, on a night where we think, you know, Rogers probably doesn't have a, a huge game through the air. I think it's tough, tough to justify going more uh, at such a high number for Devante. Yeah. And that number feels just a little too high for me. Yeah. But let, let, let's move on here and talk about another wide receiver getting a pretty high number. And that's DJ Moore, the Carolina Panthers, 90.5 is his total against the Eagles. Uh, DJ Moore is quietly, I feel like, having himself a very good season right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, the last two weeks, 12 targets in each of those two games, over 110 yards receiving in each of those two games. Uh, it seems like he's Sam Darnold's favorite target out there. And what we saw Tyreek Hill do against the Eagles last week, could DJ Moore do something similar this week against that Eagles defense? I mean, I, I was not impressed uh, by what we saw Eagles secondary last week I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that um I mean, DJ Moore right now is fourth in the league in total catches and one of the guys ahead of him is Cooper Cup who's played an extra game so I mean he's he basically was third um heading into this week he's been fantastic I, I think fantasy wise he's been easily one of the biggest breakouts of the entire season if you if you snag DJ Moore in like a mid to late round um I mean he's been like a legitimate wide receiver one for them this year um, a, a lot, of, a lot of his work last week, you know, against Dallas was in garbage time. You know, he's, he's racked up quite a few yards when it doesn't really matter, but you know, for our purposes, who cares? I mean, I, I think this fantasy, is a game right? where that's fantasy. Yeah, right. It doesn't matter at all. Uh, I, I think I, I like the more on more. I, I, th I think I've used that joke before, but I mean, how can you not? It, it's too obvious. Like you said, he has become easily the number one guy for Sam Darnold, you know, Robbie Anderson hasn't been quite as involved as maybe we thought, you know, I think teams, you know, maybe the book is kind of out on how to defend Robbie Anderson. I mean, DJ Moore can do it all. He, he's, you know, you can catch it over in the middle. He can, he can run it out. He can go deep. He is, he's turning into, you know, on most teams, probably not the type of guy you would necessarily want as your true number one, but he seems like a perfect fit with Sam Darnold. And as they continue to go on without Christian McCaffrey, I think he's going to have to lean more and more heavily on that passing game. So going up against Philly, uh, I wouldn't say this is a, an easy over for me, but I feel pretty comfortable about taking the more here. Nick, your joke, your joke last time was his name isn't DJ Less. Oh, okay. Yes, there we go. I, 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 I think I need to go like two, three weeks before I could use that one again. Facts only. Uh, yeah. It's been it's been a lot of fun watching Sam Darnold so far be the guy that everybody thought he was going to be. Uh, except for, you know, he was kind of ruined by the Jets there for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So last up here, our last guy here in the one o'clock slate, King Henry, 115.5 rushing yards is his t total against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Nick, yeah. I, I don't really need to remind you, but I'm going to remind you anyway, 10 career games against the Jags, averaging 101 yards, two times he's gone over 200 against Jacksonville, including the last time they met last season. He's got three straight games over 100 yards. Julio appears to be a game-time decision. Uh, he missed practice both Wednesday and Thursday. A.J. Brown might be coming back. Uh, so King Henry had over 30 carries last week. He's had that in two of the last three games. And then I'm also going to throw this out there, too. The Titans, uh, they got to go back to their strength here and hit their bread and butter because – uh, you can't lose back-to-back -back weeks to the Jets and the Jags. I think they might have to be relegated if that happens. So how do you feel about King Henry this week? Uh, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, everything you said checks out. 
Um, <laughs> I mean, if you, if you lose to the Jets and the Jags back to back, you might as well just end the season at that point. Um, no better team. I think you'd rather play, especially right now, this version of the Jaguars uh, coming off of that loss. I, you know, I, before the Urban Meyer situation, after that game, there were at least some positives to take away. You know, I mean, again, they almost, they should have led that game 21 nothing against the Bengals team that we think is actually like pretty good, maybe middle of the pack type of team, which for the Jaguars is the equivalent of beating like 2009 Alabama. Um, but I just think that there's too much internal turmoil, right? I mean, the, the, the thing I've been telling myself all week is like, well, you know, what if the Jags, everybody rallies around hating Urban Meyer, but it sounds like they already hated him and that didn't really work. Um, you know, like, I don't know, like, if, how is Urban Meyer, like, talking to this team on Friday and Saturday? Like, how is he, you know, on Sunday morning before the game, like, how is he getting this team jacked up? Like, I just think there, there's a good chance that they come out really flat. I think Tennessee, you know, getting healthier after that loss, like, nobody, nobody mentioned that Tennessee was without their two best receivers and have, like, no legitimate receivers in that game against the Jets. Um, you know, I, I don't think they lose that if, if those guys are healthy. Um, but I, I think Henry runs all over this defense. I, I honestly, I think the defense is the bigger problem than the offense right now uh, in Jacksonville. And I, I think they'll be reminded very quickly uh, why they are still the doormat in that division. Yeah. Uh, last week during that Titans Jets game, I texted my buddy who's a diehard Jets fan. And I, I said, I can't believe this is happening. How do you feel? And he just responded. Uh, all it took was the Titans entire passing offense to be out for the Jets to win. a game. <laughs> So uh, yeah, let's, exactly. Let's move on. Let's do our touchdown dance here. Uh, who are your three guys that are getting in the end zone in that one o'clock slate? Man, I mean, I, I got, I have, there's so many games that I feel like when we, when we do the touchdown dance, I feel like I name everybody. I'm like, I can see this guy scoring. Yeah. I can see that guy scoring yeah. as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there's an argument for Derrick Henry. I, I think I would know he's the number one guy on my list against this Jags defense. I, I think I, I already have visions of Derrick Henry, like, doing those runs where he'll, he'll like go right. And all of a sudden he's like running at like 0.5 speed yet. All the defenders are still lagging behind and he's just like shedding guys on the way to the end zone. So Derek Henry uh, is where I would start. I think that's a virtual lock against this Jaguars defense. Um, you know, I know Aaron Jones is a little bit banged up coming into this game, but again, on a, on a, on a day where we think Rogers is maybe, you know, not going to have a massive day through the air. I think they're happy uh, to utilize Aaron Jones. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like every week we, we talk about Justin Jefferson too, right? Where he, he is, seems like an automatic touchdown, uh, even if Minnesota is struggling to move the ball, uh, whether it's garbage time or, or early on, Kirk Cousins always finds a way uh, to get Justin Jefferson in the end zone. So those are the three guys, you know, that come to mind right away. You know, I, I thought about Najee Harris against that Denver defense. I have no idea how that game is going to play out. Like part of me thinks this is like the final, like we're really up against it. We're on the ropes game for Pittsburgh. Like if you lose this, you know, the season is, is really in jeopardy. And, and I think they have some really hard questions to answer. And we've seen them kind of bounce back from these situations before. Uh, so I could see Najee Harris, you know, having somewhat of a big week against Denver. But at the same time, that Pittsburgh offense has become really, really difficult to trust the way Big Ben is playing. Yep. My three guys, I, I agree with you completely. King Henry is my first. Last five games against the Jags, nine touchdowns. So I like him to continue that. Uh, I'm going to go with another Henry and I'm going to go with Hunter Henry to find the end zone mm. this week. Uh, Houston's been terrible against tight ends and it looks like Hunter Henry and Mac Jones, who are next door neighbors, by the way, are, uh, uh, have found a little bit of a rhythm mm. together. So they must be running routes out in the backyard or something like yeah. that. Get going. Hunter Henry finally finding the end zone last week against the Bucks. And then my last guy here is if he plays, I'm going CMC. Just one touchdown so far this year, and the Eagles' run defense is just absolutely terrible. So if McCaffrey plays, I like him to find the end zone as well. And let's move on to the late slate. Big matchup uh, between the Browns and the Chargers. Baker Mayfield comes into this one. 249 and a half is his, uh, is his line for this game. The Chargers defense giving up just 192 passing yards a game. Uh, and Baker's been kind of disappointing so far this season, but we've uh, we've seen now and the reports are out that he's playing through a partially torn labrum in his left shoulder, his non-throwing arm, uh, which he suffered against the Texans. I'm guessing when he stupidly tried to tackle the guy who he threw the interception to is probably how that happened. Um, but how do you feel about Baker? He's only gone over this number once, and that was week one against mm -hmm. the Chiefs. Yeah, it's hard to feel good about it, right? I mean, especially how he looked last week. That was that was the game that was on my secondary TV with Red Zone on the other. So I, I had the pleasure of watching. Like, I, I don't think it's too harsh to say that was the worst game I've ever seen Baker Mayfield play, especially when you add the qualifiers that he did not commit a turnover. Um, like, it, it was just a – it was a bizarre game. I mean, missing wide open throws left and right. Um, there were so many times where, you know, it would be a third and six, and all of a sudden they're punting, and they show the replay – 
and he's got a guy sitting wide open. You're like, how did, like, he just wasn't seeing the field. Um, and he admitted it, you know, admitted as much after the game. So there is a case that, you know, he can't play that badly again. You know, you look at the tape, he'll probably bounce back. But this Chargers defense is not the defense I, I think that you bounce back against. Um, I, I think Cleveland can hang around in this game because of its defense, but I, I don't see the Browns like moving the ball up and down on this Chargers defense, especially through the air. So for me, this is a pretty easy less. Yeah, I agree with you completely. I mean, Baker Mayfield is my season-long fantasy quarterback. I drafted him this year, and I'm already ready to cut him. So uh, I'm uh, looking at different quarterback options mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and then the other side, you got Justin Herbert. 294.5 is the total for Herbert this week. That feels a little high to me, especially with, as you mentioned, yeah. this Cleveland defense is very good with Miles Garrett and Jadavian Clowney getting after him. Uh, Cleveland's giving up just 182 passing yards a game. They held Kirk Cousins to 203 last week. And I'm reading a lot of fantasy football pages going into this weekend. And it seems like a lot of people are fading Herbert this week. How do you feel about Herbert? Well, he's my season long fantasy quarterback. So I, I felt pretty good about it until this week. I, I'm with you though. I, I don't think we see a big game from Herbert here. I think these defenses in a lot of ways are pretty evenly matched. And, and honestly, I think Cleveland's might be a little bit better. Like the way that they got to the quarterback last week, I, the secondary played really well. Uh, against the Minnesota offense that you wouldn't exactly say is like high powered, but for as much as people hate on Kirk Cousins, like the numbers look pretty good. The receiving core, especially with KJ Osborne, you know, looking like a legit number three guy, that's a really, really good receiving core. That's top three, top five in the league at worst. So um, no, I, I think I like where, where our collective heads are at here. I think both these guys, um, you know, I think they could play fine, but I don't think we see a big game on either side. I think this game could play out honestly a lot like that Cleveland Minnesota game last week where it's just, you know, punt, 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 turnover on downs, punt, punt. And, and whichever team, you know, can finally break through is the one that probably wins it. I, I completely agree with you. Uh, let's move on to the running backs here in this one. Nick Chubb, 84.5 is his line for this week. He's gone over 80 yards in every game so far this mm -hmm. season. And the Chargers run defense, if you can't throw on them, you can sure run on them, though, because they're giving up 139 yards a game on the ground. That ranks 29th in the NFL. So all the signs are there with a hurt Baker Mayfield and a bad run defense on the other side, all the signs are there for Nick Chubb to go off, right? I think so. Yeah. I mean, it's been a little bit frustrating uh, for season long fantasy owners, you know, last week, especially with Kareem Hunt coming in and, and, you know, vulturing a touchdown from Nick Chubb and, and Kareem Hunt has been a bigger part of the game plan the last couple of weeks. So maybe that's the biggest concern of all, but yeah, matchup wise, I think there's a ton to like here. Like you said, he's, his floor has been super high from a yardage perspective week to week. Uh, I, I, I'm joining you on the more here. All right. And then on the other side, you got Austin Eckler, who was the star of Monday Night Football this past week, finishing with 117 carries on the ground. He did a lot through the pass game, too. Uh, went, so after going off last week, his total, though, still sitting at 55.5. The Browns run defense, allowing just 66 yards a game, probably the big reason mm -hmm. why. But Eckler has been right around that 50 yards or more in every game so far this season. How do you feel about Eckler? Yeah, I mean, you look at his yardage totals, it's been 57, 54, 55, and then, you know, exploded for that 117 on just 15 carries last week. I mean, what, what worries me is the is the volume, right? I mean, he's, he's been able to do this against a, a defense that we thought was going to be good in Washington, and it turns out is actually not good. Uh, a defense in Dallas that is better than we expected, but still not elite. Uh, a Kansas City defense that looks terrible. And then a Vegas defense that we've kind of gone back and forth week to week. Are they actually good? Are they not? I, I think I'm inclined to go less here. I, I think I trust this Browns defense more than I trust Austin Eckler in the Chargers offense. I think if you're going to get Eckler involved, it's maybe more in the screen game. It's on swing passes out of the backfield. Um, I, I don't really see him like gouging this, this uh, Cleveland Browns defense on the ground. So I, I think we see some regression after a big week last week from Eckler and I'll go less here. All right. And then let's talk about the two big name wide receivers in this matchup. Keenan Allen, 80.5. Uh, he's came out of the gates hot with over a hundred yards in each of the first two games. And then he's kind of cooled off. The targets are still there, but he's just not getting the yardage. His uh, average yard total at per perception has just gone way down in the past two weeks, finishing with yeah. 50 yards and then 36 yards in the past two games. So 80.5 for Allen. Is he due to have a bounce back? I, I think he could be certainly. I, I was a little disappointed in Keenan Allen last week, had a couple of uncharacteristic drops in big spots uh, in that game. Uh, against Las Vegas and obviously they were able to pull it out anyway but yeah like you said after two huge weeks to begin the season it, it kind of feels like Mike Williams has maybe usurped him a little bit uh in the pecking order in that offense like Mike Williams has kind of been the guy that uh, Justin Herbert is, is starting to look to especially downfield um and, and you mentioned you know the, the yards per catch have gone way down for Keenan Allen 
these last couple of weeks. It's tough because I, I really do like this Browns defense a lot. Um, but at the same time, I, I do think we're due for, for a bounce back from Keenan Allen here. So I, I will go more uh, on that number for Keenan Allen. Probably goes just over. I don't think he gets to 100. And then we got Odell Beckham Jr. on the other side. And I know we're both kind of fading Baker Mayfield on this one. So 58.5 uh, for receiving yards for OBJ. He finished with just 27 last week. He would have had much more, but Baker completely missed him on like a 60-yard bomb. So is that, right. <laughs> how do you feel about OBJ? Right. It's tough to say. I mean, if Baker just makes even a decent throw and, and even if OB, like he was running a good throw, puts him in the end zone by 15 yards, a, a bad throw. Um, you know, he still catches it for probably like a 40 yard gain and maybe gets caught up to, but yeah. And, and if that's the case, you know, we, we kind of look at his box score, I think a lot differently. This number is maybe a little bit higher. Um, I, I got to fade Beckham this week though. I, I, I don't trust what I saw from Baker. And I, I think he goes up um, against an even more difficult defense this week. You know, like if you can't figure it out against Minnesota, um, I, I think San Diego present or San Diego, excuse me, Los Angeles uh, presents some, some much more difficult challenges. Yep, I agree. I think it's going to be a tough, tough week for Cleveland to move the ball outside of Nick Chubb. So let's move yeah. on. Let's do a little rapid fire here. We got a bunch of guys left that I want to get to before the end of the show. Let's start right off with the MVP front runner and the favorite, the quarterback of the four and no Arizona Cardinals. Who would have thought it? Kyler Murray, 288.5 is his total. Uh, four career games against the Niners, highest yardage output, just 247, averaging 217 in those games. But this is 2021 Kyler Murray, right? How do you feel about Murray? I, I love what we've seen from Kyler Murray thus far this season. I, I think he is, and I, I, I honestly regret not putting in an MVP future on Kyler Murray. Like it, in retrospect, it's like so obvious. Like, of course, he's the kind of the next guy in line to take this big step uh, that a lot of the past MVPs have, you know, kind of that Lamar Jackson type of leap. Um, I mean, he's been fantastic. I, I, I think I fully expected Arizona to be humbled a little bit last week by the Rams, and that game went completely the opposite way. Um, I, I don't think there's a quarterback right now that can match his mixture of mobility and, and passing game. You know, I, obviously I think Lamar has obviously improved quite a bit as a passer this season, and that's become maybe a, a little bit of an underrated trait for him. But I mean, Murray is, is like just as good in terms of escapability as Lamar Jackson. And he also has a better arm. I mean, it's, it's been unbelievable what we've seen from him. So not, you know, not an ideal matchup this week against San Francisco, but um, the way this offense is rolling, the weapons that they have, I think AJ Green is looking not washed up whatsoever. Um, I'll, I'll go more on Kyler. Yep. And then you got DeAndre Hopkins, his number one wide receiver, 78.5 is his total against the Niners. No 100 yard games yet this season for Nuke. It feels like he's overdue to finally pop off here. And San Fran might just be the team to do it against as they've given up big games to top targets before so far this season. Devontae had over 130 yards on him. Yep. TJ Hawkinson had nearly 100 as a tight end. And even my guy, Quez Watkins, finished with 117 against him. So how do you feel about DeAndre? I like your thinking. I think he's due. And that's kind of a, that could be a dangerous line of thinking when it comes to fantasy and, and, and sports betting, but he's too good to be held down again. Right. And I, I still think we have this picture of the San Francisco defense as like a dominant unit in our mind. And, you know, they've, they've had injuries. They haven't been quite as good as we expected. Like you said, they've, they've been prone to giving up hundred plus yard games to multiple big name receivers uh, and not big name receivers this season. So if, if there's a week for, for Hopkins to finally get back on track, I, I think this is it. And then finally, last guy here I want to talk about who is my pick to be the MVP this season. Uh, Dak Prescott, 280.5 is his passing total against the Giants coming up here in week five. Giants giving up about 260 yard passing yards a game. And it's been a few weeks since we've seen Dak that we were expecting this year coming back off that injury after he had that monster game in week one. He's kind of cooled off and hasn't had over 240 yards since then. But this could be a possible shootout with Daniel Jones. Can you believe it? How do you feel about Dak this week? Yeah, I mean, it's fair that we, we haven't seen, quote unquote, the same Dak since week one, but I mean, he's also been super efficient. They just haven't needed him uh, to throw the ball that many times. You know, I mean, the, the running game has been so good the last couple of weeks. What did he have? 22 attempts last week in, in a blowout win over Carolina. Yeah. Um, and, and some of those yards came in garbage time when that game was over. So they, they just haven't really had to lean on Dak quite as heavily as they have the last couple of years, which from a long-term team perspective is great. Uh, Fantasy-wise, you know, makes it a little bit more more difficult to predict week to week. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over on Dak. I, I think people are, are hopping on the Giants bandwagon maybe a little too much. That was a really strange game against the Saints last week. I thought the Saints blew that more than the Giants took it away from them. Uh, it's a kind of bizarre play calling by Sean Payton late in that game. 
Um, and I think if the Saints hold on and New York doesn't win that game, I feel like we everyone feels completely differently about that team. So I, I'm going to try to not read too much into what we saw in week four. Yeah, the Saints were my survivor pick last week. It was an absolutely tough week watching that game. Not believe Brutal. It.